On today's Collider Movie Talk, Wonder Woman hates Cheetos, Chris Hemsworth puts on sunglasses, and Michael Rappaport's roommate from the movie gets his own role. Collider Movie Talk starts right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collider and Movie Talk. This is The Daily Show. We're going to run you through all the latest in the world of movies with some returning favorites here. Very happy to welcome back to the show, Miss T. How are you, T? I'm doing great. It feels good to be back in this fancy new space y'all got going. It's pretty big. Yeah, it's that is what he said. This is our palatial <laughs> estate, and for once, he was not lying. Perry Nemiroff is also <laughs> joining us here on this lovely Thursday. Yeah, I, I'm not a returning guest. I'm just here, as always, so hope you enjoy it. You're a regular returning guest, yeah. and it is a, a huge pleasure of mine to welcome back to the show. After a recent stint in a hospital, he's back. He's back to fighting weight, 100%, or at least 95 Mr. J. Washington. Man, I'm back at 100%. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you for the claps I heard. Uh, the hole in my throat is closed. And ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to see you all. I didn't know which camera to look at, but I'm here. All right? There How does talking at. feel? You good? Uh, it feels great to talk because it was weird having to talk only through a whiteboard like I was in a Schmodown contest for everything. <laughs> like, only on a whiteboard. When I went to go hang with the, uh, the hospital when you were going through your procedure, it was like the most peaceful uh, it, you know, interaction we've ever had because you couldn't speak at couldn't all. Speak, yeah. yeah. Thank you to you and everybody else who took advantage of that. <laughs> and say, like everybody who came and saw me, they would take, they were like, oh, he can't say anything back. So they would just say everything they wanted to say <laughs> and mm -hmm. my face would just tell them, Oh, as soon as I get my voice back, you're catching it. So, Mark, when we get off air, I've got some things. To hey, do. I brought you baseball cards, and I did bring you a uh, fidget spinner and a fidget spinner and a fidget spinner and a fidget spinner. And a fidget spinner. And a fidget right. spinner. Yeah. yeah. So it's just it's just a friendly reminder, all you kids out there, if you have a buddy who's in the hospital, make sure you take advantage of them in any way you possibly yeah. can. We're gonna move on to our first story here today, and that is according to the Hollywood Reporter. Excuse me, that's actually Deadline. The Hollywood Reporter broke a story about Collider yesterday. Deadline is talking about the new villain in Wonder Woman 2, and that is none other than Cheetah, played by Kristen Wiig. Apparently, Patty Jenkins has had her eye on Wiig for a while now to play this role, and it looks to be confirmed. So, the cheetah is going to be going up against Wonder Woman in the sequel to the smash hit Wonder Woman that came out last year. The new movie comes out November 1st, 2019. Jay Washington, if anybody on the panel knows a little something about Cheetah, it's going to be you. What does this mean for Wonder Woman 2? Oh, yeah, the comic books. No, because I was like, how does that work? You know what? For First of all, it's one of Wonder Woman's biggest adversaries, which is cool to use. Granted, they didn't do it in the first movie because you'd have burned her out from World War One and had nothing to go on forward, forward to. Kristen Wiig is an interesting casting choice, as we've been seeing a lot lately with comedic actors and actresses. But I said this on Twitter. If we could get... Re uh, Elizabeth Banks as Rita Repulsa. Granted, the movie, the Power Rangers movie, was a whole different story. The take they did on Rita was nice. The way she looked, the, the different look, the vision of her. I can see Kristen Wiig playing this. Now, will she be as serious or comedic is the question. You know. Now, also, the story of Cheetah is a British archaeologist who goes in Africa. They had an opportunity to make this potentially a black British woman. There's a lot of different things you can do. Granted, you don't have to change the culture and the nationality of the character, but you could have done a bunch of different things. Kristen Wiig is a good choice, I believe, but we'll have to see. You know, when you tweeted yesterday about the Rita Repulsa comparison, it was an interesting one. And I know, Perry, you really glommed on to that. The did, second did Jay you said you Rita Repulsa, you looked at me. I knew it. Uh, the funny thing is, your read on Power Rangers is the exact opposite of the general consensus, where everyone's like, oh, Rita Repulsa was too much. But this movie was actually pretty good otherwise. I mean, I like, I actually like, the, I'm a Power Rangers fan, I'll admit that. And I know the old school Rita Repulsa that everybody was hoping to see. And granted, you have to change things sometimes. So using the way they did Elizabeth Banks with this one, the Krispy Kreme thing was a little bit too much, I'll admit. But the look is what I was talking about. We didn't expect her to look as badass as she did. And who's to say Kristen Wiig can't look like that? Now, granted, we saw some fan oh, art yeah. that was terrifying. It looked like everything that nightmares. It's a <laughs> it's a beautiful piece of art because I know that person does create a lot of fan art, no, and it's person, stunning. It's that stunning person work. Decided but... not to go to sleep that night and just was like that's just. <laughs> no, but that's the that's that's question <laughs> I have about the character Cheetah in general is mm -hmm. just like like because the the complaint that I think a lot of Power Rangers fans had about Elizabeth Banks as Rita Repulsa, she was doing her job. If your job was to be in the '90s show Power Rangers. 
Rangers. She just right. didn't seem to fit in with the tone of what the new movie was trying to do. So how does a character like Cheetah, who from the fan art or from whatever else you want to look in the comic books, seems a little more outlandish than what we got in Wonder Woman, the first movie, how is that going to jive with the tone? I think because this is the first outlandish character we really get that's a human who transforms into something else. With Justice League, you had Steppenwolf. That's an outworldly creature just in itself. With Aquaman, you're going to get everything that's naturally in Atlantis, so we understand that. This is going to be something new to see for the DCEU. You know, that's going to be the interesting part behind it. Again, we don't, we saw, a lot of people say, oh, well, Kristen Wiig did in Ghostbusters and other films, but it, this has to be something different. Will it have a comedic element? Potentially. Can she go serious? We'll see. Yeah, and Perry, I mean, like, I, I remember being a kid and, and seeing, like, comedians turn into the, these villainous roles, and I rooted for every one of them. When I found out Eddie Murphy was going to be playing a vampire, I'm like, yes! That was the greatest vampire ever with a perm. Yeah, yeah, the greatest. movie didn't work out too well. When I heard Jim Carrey was going to be the Riddler, I'm like, yeah, he was great. <laughs> the movie didn't work out too well. When I found out Robin Williams was going to be in One Hour Photo or Insomnia, mm -hmm. I'm like, this could work out, and I think it did. I think comics can tap in to a darker side of their personality. Do you think Kristen Wiig is going to be able to do well, that? Well, I've told you, when I've seen you do stand-up, you get this mean face on, so I think Mark Ellis could be <laughs> a super villain. <laughs> you get this look on your face. It's but <laughs> Kristen, Kristen Wiig, I've seen her do enough now, and especially because when, I, when Roka and I jumped on the desk last night, it was just news dropped, sit there, and give us right off the bat your initial impression on this story. And anybody, it seems like the large majority of people out there, when they heard this, they're like, Whoa, that, like, that was unexpected. The more I think about it, the more I read about it, and the more I revisit her other work, particularly Skeleton Twins sticks out in my mm. mind. I wouldn't say that her role in that necessarily makes me think, oh, she's going to be a good DC villain, but I've seen enough of her work to know that she is very talented, and I don't want to box people in. I'm curious to see what she does with this, but still, I have to admit, it's an out-of-left-field choice. Yeah, T, there, there's some news we're going to be talking about on this show where it's like you feel about it one way, and then the next week you feel the same exact way. Did you get this news and then have an initial reaction, and has that changed at all since you heard about this yesterday? I don't think so. Actually, Perry took the words right out of my mouth, including the reference to the Skeleton Twins, because when I first heard this, I have confidence in Kristen Wiig to be able to take her talent and go from the comedic to the dramatic. I feel like generally that transition works much better than dramatic actors trying to go comedic. However... My question really is, how does this affect the tone of what Wonder Woman 2 is going to be? Because if they are bringing Kristen Wiig, are they planning to make this more of a sort of lighthearted, comedic type of film compared to the first one where there are very negligible, humorous moments? You know, there's a few moments of levity, but it's not going that route of like, oh, yucka, 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 like they do in, in, the, in, in the MCU movies so much. So I'm wondering if they're trying to maybe lighten things up with this casting rather than actually having Kristen be so super hardcore, dramatic, evil villain. Right. Most of the laughs that you got from Wonder Woman were, were very genuine. I think the reason for that is because she was legitimately trying to find her way in the man's world, so to speak, because she went out of her box at Themyscira, and her interactions, the chemistry with Chris Pine is where we got most of the yucks, but if you look at a movie like Ghostbusters, obviously, that's more spoofy than right. anything that you're going to see in <clears> Wonder <throat> Woman. So here's the big question. Here's the hurdle they have to get over. It seems like everybody in the panel is a fan of Kristen Wiig, and that they can be won over to her performance. Mm -hmm. But Wonder Woman is under just a little bit of pressure yet again, because the first time Wonder Woman came out, it had to rescue us from this dark, gritty tone, and it succeeded. And then you have Justice League, and now a very divisive movie again. So whatever Aquaman does, which by all accounts is going to have a more serious, darker tone, James Wan's the guy's directing it, what do we need Wonder Woman 2 to have in order to make Kristen Wiig fit into this? Jack? I think a balance, because as we saw with Justice League, they were trying to shift the entire tone of the DCEU. They, from Zack Snyder's darker version to Joss Whedon's lighter, humorous version, they're trying to shift the tone. And like you said, with Aquaman, James Wan has said it's kind of dark, but it's James Wan, so what do you expect? I think it's the balance. You're going to have that humorous element with Wonder Woman. Like you said, in the first one, you had those humorous moments. And I think we're going to tap into that a little more. Diana plays around now. We've seen that. She jokes more. And now she's more acclimated to the world. Again, is this present day? Is this World War II? But it doesn't matter. I think it'll have a little more humor. And Patty Jenkins knows what she's doing. I trust Patty Jenkins more than anything else. So... 
that's why I figured like we can't go wrong. That's the thing, is it T? I mean, I look at this casting partially as Patty Jenkins saying, you know what, the rest of the DCU, y'all do whatever you want with your director changes, with your your hirings and firings of executives, with your cast coming and going. I'm gonna make the movie I want to make. If I want to cast Kristen Wiig as a cheetah, I'm going to do it. I can do what I want right now. Yeah, and I think what also helps give me more confidence in that is she sort of you know, has envisioned Kristen Wiig as playing this role from day one. She essentially is writing the role for Kristen, and the only person who had any reticence, according to the press anyway, was Kristen. So I think that it'll be sort of tailored to Kristen Wiig will actually make this work a lot more holistically and, and cohesively than maybe like crowbarring in a comedic actress into a role where it really wasn't meant for her. Yeah, Perry, I'm, I'm looking at the chat right now, and, and it really, it, it seems like it's a lot more positive than I thought it might be, just because the news of hearing Kristen Wiig playing a villain in a comic book movie isn't something that's all that expected. What has been the public perception in your eyes from yesterday to today? I, I feel like based on who I've interacted with, they followed a similar path that I have. That's not to say everybody did that, but... I would like to think that especially now when we get so many superhero movies with mm. so many different interpretations of villains that folks are more open-minded to actors that you wouldn't expect because really if we didn't have casting like this, we would be boxing ourselves in as viewers to the same kind of villain over and over. And it's like, initially, having very limited knowledge of what Cheetah is in the source material, obviously my mind went directly to Catwoman. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, <laughs> can Kristen Wiig play Catwoman? <laughs> well, not really like Michelle Pfeiffer. And then all of a sudden I'm just stuck in these same things that I've seen before. So I think that more than anything is what is getting me excited about this casting. And just reading a little bit about the character and the particular version of this character that they're running with, one of the most interesting little bits that I think could really enhance her is the idea of when she becomes the cheetah and gets that ability, it also comes with a flip side where she's almost like she can't function because of it too. Right. Because so something along the lines of what, what is it? Uh, the person who becomes the cheetah is supposed to be a virgin, and I think because yeah, she's, she's not, not a virgin, it, right? It deteriorate, it make, deteriorates her body, or she can't it, quite handle it. It makes it her more aggressive. She actually becomes way more aggressive and more, more just feral almost. Because she's not a virgin, and right. which is, I, that's going to be a big comedic part, I guarantee you. I imagine uh, one's bathing habits change once you become a cheetah. A lot more licking as opposed to actually hopping in the shower. I'll confirm that with Dewey later. <laughs> <laughs> Perry does have Deputy Dewey. How is Dewey going to feel about this casting? That's the big question. Well, if Kristen Wiig came as a shock to many of you, our next story probably won't, <coughs> and that is that Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt are once again teaming up with Quentin Tarantino for his new film set around the Manson murders, or at least with the Manson murders as the backdrop in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The story is set to take place in Los Angeles in 1969, at the height of hippie Hollywood. So DiCaprio, we knew had been looked at for a while, and then we knew there was this other role that was floating out there that might be for Brad Pitt, might be for Tom Cruise. T, with Brad Pitt once again joining Quentin Tarantino's team, do you like this call? Sure. I mean, it doesn't really excite me all that much because I feel like to a certain extent, Quentin Tarantino has his company of actors who he works with, you know, repeatedly on various projects. He's worked with Brad Pitt before. He's worked with DiCaprio before. What I'm far more excited to see is who he casts as Charles Manson, because I'm very <laughs> excited about this project. We talked about this on an old uh, movie talk, I think sometime last year when it was first announced that Tarantino was even doing this project about who our dream casting would be for Charles Manson. So I'm still very excited to see who it is, and I'm hoping that he goes with my pick, which is Ben Foster. Oh, I like that. Ben, the Ben Foster pick is really good. Yeah. And then we had somebody, I, I, it's, I'm not going to say one up the Ben Foster. But yeah, we had a his, good one. From his, from his huge palatial estate slash office, <laughs> Copster yelled, Walton Goggins. And we're like, oh, that's oh, really good yeah. yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. And he's got the, the history of Tarantino, but I love the Ben Foster yeah. call. Uh, Perry, what I love about this story is that we knew that it was uh, DiCaprio is going to be playing this longtime actor in a Western series, Rick Dalton. Brad Pitt is his stunt double. So just just the, the fact that Brad Pitt is the stunt double for Leonardo DiCaprio is just a funny thing. Like it's a, it's going to be a funny thing for them to play with on set, I think. But it also lends itself to how they're going to be adapting to this new style of Hollywood going away from the TV studio system as the 60s are about to turn into the 70s. That's what excites me more than anything. Obviously, I'm thrilled that these two are going to be his leads. I love Inglorious. And obviously, we have DiCaprio doing great work in Django. So I kind of figured it would 
pan out this not this way exactly but something <laughs> along the lines of him picking from his pre-existing pool of actors that he's collaborated with the story is what gets me especially right now i mean obviously it was obviously it was a completely different landscape mm -hmm. back then but the idea of being in that transition type period like we are right now with tv and film moving to streaming i think there's a lot of really interesting commentary you can make about that specific time while also tapping into what we're going through right now and i really hope he digs into that uh jay washington we got brad pitt leo dicaprio who are you more excited to see uh the over and under on the n-word usage out of leo <laughs> dicaprio in this movie <laughs> <laughs> that's because it's a quintet in tarantino script they're like ah oh, you i really don't feel like saying <laughs> i did i did this before do i have to do this again okay, you know leo's <laughs> method like he's getting into it in the 60s nah uh it's gonna be interesting i'm excited to see what leo brings to this again we talked about this before this is his first major role coming off the oscar win and so with the backdrop of Manson is going to be interesting because you hear the backdrop. It's not the forefront. Mm -hmm. Like that's normally weird. Not That's weird to hear. You normally hear it's about what's happening during the Manson murders. No, no, it's in the backdrop. And now he's playing a struggling actor. How do you tell an actor who's won an Academy Award, you have to play a struggling actor <laughs> that's dealing with the transition of Hollywood? That is going to be interesting for me to see. You know, you brought something interesting up, though, because Tarantino... The over-under over, over on the N-word? Oh, no, yes, yes, that's actually <laughs> what I want to talk about, is because Tarantino's scripts were so freewheeling back in the day that mm -hmm. took place in modern times. The last couple movies he's done have been more period pieces yes. where you have more of a license to get away with characters saying whatever they want. Now, this is obviously a period piece, too, but in the culture we're in today, do you think that the script is going to be a little more PC-conscious in mm -hmm. the way of having these hugely famous actors actors and what comes out of their mouth i don't think so i think quentin tarantino sticks to quentin tarantino's guns he will not i, I i've never we haven't seen quentin tarantino change yet he caught so much hell about django before it even dropped and we get, still got the hateful eight mm -hmm. and so he's not changing who he is as a director as a screenwriter his actors know who he is his actors are going to work with him just as it is whatever the role entails and granted, we're going to have that criticism that come out. We're going to have those think pieces in those blogs. But it's still going to be the ninth film by Quentin Tarantino at the end of the day. Yeah, T, he said it to be working on this script for the better part of the last five years. Do you think it's going to change how he's... Do you think that the world that we're in today, as opposed to when he started making films, is going to affect how the dialogue is written at all? I'm with Jay. Absolutely not. I, I think that Quentin Tarantino, you know, he's got an ego, but he's also got... Stacks of paper to back up that ego. So quite frankly, he's got no reason to change. You know, he catches heat with every film release that comes out as we get into a more and more PC society. But he hasn't changed one iota, and I, has, I have no uh, expectation for him to start now. Yeah, period. You see it that way, too. And that if that is what happens, is that any sort of press negative or positive is good press for the movie? Well, obviously, we've been talking about the Uma Thurman situation. Mm -hmm. And I was really wondering if that was going to affect him at all here and clearly it's not this movie is moving forward full steam and then on top of that there was another report that just came out that because this movie is going ahead with brad pitt they're delaying world war z2 to shoot later in the fall so this is clearly taking the priority for him so i don't think anything like that is going to stop him for the foreseeable future i do think we're going to get a bajillion think pieces out there and mm -hmm. you know it is something well worth discussing and in terms of the script and what he actually puts in there i feel like when you do something like this obviously you have to be responsible about the way you approach it but if you're not going to have that honesty then What's the point in doing it at all, then? You know, you brought up World War Z, too. Brad Pitt's producing that, too. So if he's got a project that he's starring in and producing, and he's put that on the shelf for a Quentin Tarantino movie, you know he's thinking this could be a statue, right? That's got to be why you delay something like this. Either that or Quentin Tarantino has some real dirt on him. <laughs> <laughs> Quentin just Tarantino just emailed him some pictures with watermarks, like, gone open O's. I think, I think it's safe to say that whoever you are in life, whatever walk of life you live in, if you get an envelope in the mail and it doesn't have a return address and you open it and it's just like a negative of film, <laughs> it's probably not a good... Not that it's ever happened to me. Jay, I don't know what that's like. First of all, why is it a negative? <laughs> Who still has the negative strips? You, you hold it up to a light and be like... 
wait, where was I? 96? Like, <laughs> you're like, oh, God, Vegas. That's right. <laughs> well, we're going to move on to our next story, and that is Rashida Jones has been tapped to help pen the 9 to 5 reboot. 9 to 5 was a huge movie in the early 80s and has had a number of different iterations on Broadway, musicals, and others starring Dolly Parton, Jane Fonda, and Lily Tomlin. So Rashida Jones is going to be working on the new 9 to 5, but with the original creator, Pat Resnick. And what's more so is that it's going to take place more in a modern work setting with three younger females dealing with sexism, with chauvinism, equal pay, all of that stuff. However, it does appear that they're going to try to get the three original ladies back in the movie as well to serve as mentors <laughs> to this new younger generation. Perry, I, I, I'm a big fan of Rashida Jones and whatever she wants to pursue. I think that 9 to 5 is one of those movies you hear us debate about all the time on this show. What 80s movies, what movies of all time should be rebooted, what should never be touched? 9 to 5 is a great comedy, and I think it is so ripe to be remade for another generation. I've been thinking about it nonstop with any form of adaptation. Why remake a movie? Why adapt a book when you can have an original story? Sometimes those original stories, though, are so special and could change so drastically when applied to just the modern, mm -hmm. modern society right now. And what better example of something to modernize than this story? The only thing that is crossing my mind that has me a little hesitant about this is actually bringing back the original cast members for some reason, I, I want to see, I want to just make sure that it's not done in kind of like a hokey in your face way. And, you know, I actually was okay with the new Ghostbusters movie, but I didn't like the way the original, most of the original cast I was incorporated in that movie. I can't that mistake again, Ugh. because I think they actually serve a purpose in this movie. I think they, I think they do. It's just how they serve that purpose, where I just want to make sure it's done organically through these new characters, their journey, rather than just like, like, wink, wink, remember when. But I can't, I can't imagine it's going to be like that. And for no other reason, because I can't remember what award show it was, but all three of them reunited, I think, for, for some sort of award show. And they got a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody was celebrating these three women that were in 9 to 5. And it's like, yes, they, they can still play a meaningful part in this movie. I think they could definitely do it. I'm just eyeing all the little potential red flags right now. <laughs> and really... That is kind of the only one that has jumped out to me because I think the concept is brilliant. It's brilliant for this time and what they could add to it. And who wouldn't want Rashida Jones working on something like this? Yeah, T, it's almost like the, the creation of the art is going to reflect what we see on screen where you have a trio of younger women being mentored by the original cast, Rashida Jones, working with Pat Resnick, the creator of the whole thing. Is this uh, something that speaks to you? Yeah, I think I'm pretty excited to see exactly how they pull this off because I'm with Perry. I am a little, just a little bit nervous about the whole wink, wink, remember that part from the first movie kind of thing, overwhelming the fresh take. But I think they will be able to pull it off mainly because I do have so much faith in just the sensibilities and creative talents of the original cast. You know, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin are having great success with Grace and Frankie. It's actually a really fun show. So I think just in terms of them sort of like still being on their game, still being funny, still being with it and knowing what's sharp and what's smart, that gives me good confidence. And I think also working with Rashida Jones, who in my opinion is very smart and doesn't even get as much credit as she deserves as a writer and creator. I think I think they can pull it off. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. And Rashida Jones, growing up, uh, you know, obviously in the public eye, being the the daughter of Quincy Jones, and and seeing Hollywood from a very young perspective, she might actually be the best choice for that reason to do a reboot because she's seen the evolution of Hollywood, the evolution of comedy in there, which is one of the reasons why she is such a talent. Jay, is there is there something to my theory that you can actually get better at making reboots, where it's like anything, you study game film and you see what could we have done better with Ghostbusters? How could we have rebooted that better to where maybe this movie five ten years from now we're going to be better and more careful about how we go about making reboots you you just said it you study the past you study game film except for spider-man uh <laughs> thankfully now homecoming is okay but they, st they studied the game film yeah because it took so long and so much game film but you she's no she knows it from the inside and again we've seen this ghostbusters again everybody's like oh we'll give the cast a try but everybody's like there's a precedent set and then we watched and we saw how you just shoved in Bill Murray. You shoved in Dan Aykroyd. It's like, uh, that's not what you should have done. This, I think she knows how to do it. Rashida Jones can do no wrong in my eyes. She is brilliant. She is com her comedic timing is amazing. She Angie Tribeca is one of the greatest shows out. So for her to take a classic comedy 
like this. And again, like you said, Lily Tomlin and Jane, Jane Fonda are doing amazing with Grace and Frankie. This, there's a recipe for success already built in. There's nothing that can go wrong. If they, anything goes wrong, this is not in Rashida's hands at all. It's just somebody just said, hey, how about somebody in the studio was like, how about you just do this? And it was out of her control. But if what she writes this, she writes a script, the main cast, again, a Dolly Parton cameo somewhere slid in. Like, it does not forced in. It's just slid in somewhere. It all works. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the greatest office <laughs> comedies of all time, I think 9 to 5 is up there. My favorite office comedy ever is Office Space, and you look forward to me and Makuka at Knapsack doing a commentary on that very soon for Knapsack's Patreon. <laughs> I think that 9 to 5, the reboot, is going to obviously modernize what the office workplace mm-hmm. is going to be like. And if you have three younger ladies who are taking the center role, anybody got any casting options that you want to throw out on the table right now? <sighs> Rashida Jones could be one of them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, she generally does tend to appear in most of the things that she pens or, or works on creatively. But uh, gosh, you know, I was also just thinking in terms of other creative forces who could be able to handle this in terms of like addressing the current climate and, and actually having a funny slash poignant take. I was just thinking of how great uh, Amy Poehler and Tina Fey were with hosting award shows and just talking about things that were happening in all of those instances when they kept hosting the Golden Globes. And I feel like this is almost Rashida Jones's chance to do a similar thing in a movie format. Um, but casting wise, gosh, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Let's hear what you guys I got one. I got T- Tessa Thompson. And uh, you know why I'm bringing this up. Yes. She is so good in Ragnarok. I just love you gotta the, watch I love the sass of that character. And to see someone like that, that kind of powerhouse navigate navigate like work hierarchy, that sounds like a perfect pairing. With that same similar type of vibe she had oh, as yeah. Valkyrie. Oh my I like yeah. Tessa Thompson. I like the couple. Like, I, 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 I enjoy the Pitch Perfect movies for what they are, but I think that uh, too often Rebel Wilson has been put into one box, and I think that this could be the kind of vehicle that would get her out of that and let her be herself a little bit more. But I would also pair her with Tiffany Haddish. Well, I think Tiffany Haddish yes. is such a, a comedic force to be reckoned with right now. I would love to see them two together. I know who something. you keep away from this, and it may not be a popular uh-huh. opinion. Kate McKinnon. And I say that because Kate McKinnon is being shoehorned into things. Remember Rough Night? Everybody was like, oh, this is going to be amazing with her. I thought she was the best part of Rough Night. There, <sighs> there's people, I, the there, accent is what did it She for me. was fine in Rough Night, but Rough Night had some major problems that I don't care what any of yeah. those actors brought to that movie. Because <laughs> yeah, was everybody was holding on to Scarlett Johansson like, she's going to be the best. Like, <laughs> See, mm-hmm. I also thought Kate McKinnon was the best part of, uh, of the Ghostbusters remake, too. It was, it was between her and Leslie Jones, yeah. and, and I'd love to see either one of them in this movie, but Kate McKinnon is one of those, those, Do you those just actresses. Shoehorn that really in, does, though? I don't care if you shoehorn her in if she's funny. If, if you're making okay. me laugh, then I'm going to be happy with it. But she does cause a divide amongst fans, and it's a weird thing yeah. to see that it's like like there's there's people who just enjoy. I think everybody enjoyed Girls Trip, right? We're just like like we're laughing mm-hmm. along. Tiffany Haddish is stealing a lot of the scenes, but everybody's great. And then you have an actress like Kate McKinnon who comes on screen, and it's like some people love her and some people hate her, and I simply don't get it. I think it comes with the territory when you take big risks like that. I mean, I agree. either everyone's going to love you, everyone's going to hate <laughs> you, or we're going to be talking about how divisive it is. <laughs> which well, is luckily, good either way it goes we're talking regardless yeah no matter yeah, which way true. we're talking but i mean it's really up to you guys we're gonna let the chat room cast the new nine to five reboot mm-hmm. then we'll we'll call rashida and pat resnick and let them know who you guys say so comment right now or on youtube after the fact we love hearing from you guys our next story is chris hemsworth you guys know him as thor we just talked about ragnarok well it does appear he is going to be the lead in the new men in black spinoff that's right the men in black spinoff has been through many iterations there's been a lot of rumors about what this will or will not in Include. Could it be a, a team up with 21 Jump Street? Doesn't appear that's happening just yet, but Chris Hemsworth is being eyed to play the lead in it. Now, apparently what they would like to have is Chris Hemsworth, a black female, and then an older person who's kind of mentoring these two young ones. Apparently this is going to take place in the same Men in Black universe as the original movie. So we're not totally rebooting it. We're just ushering in a new generation of people in black. Jay Washington, is that the right way? to reboot yes, this franchise. Yes, and don't, sk- because everybody was concerned they were going to skip over doing this and go straight into the crossover with 22 Jump Street. So I'm fine with this one. <laughs> I'm perfectly, because again, if you're going to usher in this new generation, especially after Men in Black 3, a lot of people, there, it was device, that was a very split movie. A lot of people were like, well, I like Josh Brolin, but then again, I didn't. Will Smith could have been better, but then he was acting like Will Smith. Could not stand that movie. Oh, my God, I could not stand that movie. But there were some who were just diehard MIB fans who were with it. 
Chris Hemsworth has proven he is a comedic force when he is allowed to do what he wants to do, and he can do it well. And if you're going to do this pairing, I can't. Chris Simsworth with aliens, we've already seen what he does with monsters. <laughs> His interact again, let us go back to Thor Ragnarok. His interaction with Surtur in the very beginning of Thor Ragnarok is hysterical. So expand that into either, you know, because we don't know if he's an established member of MIB, if he becomes like the Will Smith S character where he's drafted and he has to find this out. I don't think it could be a problem with this. I, I'm for it. I'm here for this. When Chris Hemsworth was cast to play Thor, it made sense on its ear because it's like, oh, well, he's he's blonde and he's jacked. Okay, good call. <laughs> and then when you see him in Thor, it's like he's put in this box where he's, he's as guarded and he doesn't know really how our language or our colloquialisms work, but he's still funny. He is still able to be mm -hmm. funny. And then you put him in a bad movie and he's the best part of that, like with Vacation. Or you get to see him in Ghostbusters and he's got some good lines in there. So I like Chris Hemsworth being a leading man, but also being comedic. However, he just has not hit at the box office away from the Marvel movies like I think he should, Perry. So is this movie going to help that or is it going to hurt that? That's a fair thing to consider, especially because if this really takes off, this is going to be his MCU follow up unless he renews his contract. So this is a <laughs> big deal for him yeah. right now. As someone who is looking at it from the viewer perspective, though, I actually like the crossover idea. That, to me, was the way to reinvigorate the franchise without getting me thinking, like, oh, I just, I, I didn't like the last one. I don't really want another one of these. Combining the two made me excited. Then they went away from that idea, and I didn't care anymore. F. Gary Gray did pique my interest. Casting Chris Hemsworth as, as the lead, if this all goes through, that's the way to get me back fully on board only thing that concerns me, because right now clearly we're on a Thor Ragnarok mm -hmm. kick, is he's so good in that movie. And I do think anything I've seen him in that's a comedy, he has been able to shine even through bad films like Vacation. Taika Waititi's sensibility paired with him. And I'm not entirely sure what kind of comedy F. Gary Gray is going to bring to this. So I'm pumping the brakes a little because of that. But can I fan cast this? I want you to fan cast Okay, it. so I want Chris Hemsworth. I want Letitia Wright and I want Richard Jenkins. I was literally going to say Letitia Wright after seeing her in Black Panther. Yeah, because she, she's she's good. Greatest. She's so good at Shuri, and she's she's got that that like that tech element in her character in Black Panther that I think could translate naturally into something like this. Plus, it, the movie's going to take place in London, so the tea leaves are pointing in a positive direction, at least for us here on the table. T, are you? Are you with us? I'm with you guys, because I definitely have men in black franchise fatigue, and I feel like this could be a real good shot in the arm. This sounds almost more like a spinoff than just another installment in the same sort of storyline. So I think that that'll be refreshing. Not to mention Chris Hemsworth, I mean, obviously in Ragnarok, but also in Ghostbusters, like you touched upon. I feel like he, in many ways, was a scene stealer in any scene he was in in that movie. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone was sort of taken aback by just how funny he actually was. So I think that balance of action comedy, it's something that we don't really get anymore. The sort of action comedy is a woebegone genre that we haven't really had since the 90s in any legitimate sense. So I feel like this could be a way to sort of reinvigorate not just the franchise, but that genre overall. Yeah, so let's walk down the Men in Black memory lane. And you guys tell me if you agree or disagree with me is that I love the first Men in Black. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great concept it was it was made at the perfect time people love the x-files and you you know i would watch a lot of those like sci-fi shows where it's like there's real men in black and they come to your door after you see aliens such a great time will smith was apex will smith tommy lee jones was huge loved that movie then men in black 2 came out and i'm like ah, I, I fell asleep in the theater i'll give it a pass this is going to be like quantum of solace and it was just a Ooh. weird movie Ooh. and we can come back <laughs> with a third one and i want to see tommy lee jones and will smith again and then that third movie happened and i just hate hate hated everything about it to the point where I was ready to blow it up. Yet, I find myself, Jay, liking the fact that we're continuing on in this universe because I do feel like we can pay some homage to Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones without having to have them come back. Exactly, and I agree with that. And then to go back to what Perry was saying earlier, not knowing what F. Gary Gray can do, this is the man that gave us Friday. That's he, a great point. That's he gave us Friday. And Friday is one of the all-time classic comedic movies. Yeah. And I, he would know. He's have to been. He has to have been watching Chris Hemsworth, what he's been doing on a comedic level, to know. Hey, this is the guy I want at the forefront. Men in Black is predicated on being comedic. Granted, it's Will Smith and it's, he was an action star, but then he wants to be funny. It's, but it's, it has its comedic elements. This is what Chris Hemsworth does. Now you say fan casting. Do you put Letitia Wright? Maybe. But again, to go back to it, I think this is perfect. I think you do have this film, pay homage to the original. 
do you sprinkle in Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones? You don't have to. You can. You know, you can just reference them. They, they do the pop-up at the end, as always, the little after-scene credit pop-up. But I think this is a perfect way to do it. You pay homage to the original. You have different points of references. You know, hey, there was this incident with the lights of Zartha. Or there was an instant with the galaxy, you know, it was on Orion's belt, stuff like that. You reference those things. You can do that. Okay, so short of having Sean Connery come back to play the older person who's like in charge of everything, <laughs> it, like I think that I, I thought J.K. Simmons would be a great choice, but then it's Rip, like, well, Rip Torn did. It no, takes place not, in no. London. <laughs> Rip Torn, I don't think he's dead, but he's kind of he, he's kind of lost his marbles a little bit. So I, we, <laughs> that'd we'd be, still be if, fine. That'd be the perfect Zed did. If someone's dead, it's probably not a good call. <laughs> yeah, but look, yeah. this is a, look. The internet has killed so many people off every two weeks. All of a sudden, you gotta be like, is that a real article? <laughs> right, no, not right. Dead. Yeah. So you don't know. So Men in Black will have a reboot. We don't have a uh, the announcement of the date just yet, but it is going to be a continuation of the current Men in Black franchise. But uh, thankfully, it's going to be very, very different. Will Chris Hemsworth write a hit single that accompanies the Men in Black movie? That's what I was going to ask. I was like, who's going to do the song? <laughs> I want to see a Chris Hemsworth, Chris, Chris Hemsworth nod to your heads. I want to see him do a whole dancing with the, with the worms and everything. The him with the worms and everything. I want to see the worms. That <laughs> now I kind of want Oscar Isaac in this movie so he oh could do a little Ex Machina in the oh. background. I need that music Oscar video. Isaac dancing like 8,000% more in my the life. The best part There's of Sucker Punch <laughs> is that really weird musical number he does at the end of it. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just officially fan casted your Men in Black reboot <laughs> with everything we need. So please spread the word <laughs> to everyone. We need Oscar Isaac dancing. We need a Mark Ellis cameo at a desk. Just something. And we'll also have David Harbour do his dad dance in the background for Stranger <laughs> Things too so this is going to be a good movie all of a sudden if we have anything to say about it well a movie that we hope is great comes out May 25th of this year and that is the Han Solo movie Solo a Star Wars story we got a new international trailer yesterday that is pretty much the same trailer that we've already seen. The bigger story to me is that we got a sweet new international poster for the Solo movie as well. So when you take a look at that, Perry, it's a lot of cool stuff to get excited about. Or is it just we're throwing a lot of stuff against the wall and we hope that fans remember Han Solo? I feel bad that you think that poster is cool because I, I really <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it at all. That looks like they just like photoshopped the two of them out and plopped them in a very uh, digitized looking background and just, you know, fit the Millennium Falcon in however it would shine the most behind the title. Photoshop I, has so many unique tools, though. Like, you can do a lot with Photoshop now. It's not just lassoing and putting stuff in. There's like a whole <laughs> lot of shading and stuff you can do. Yeah, but most of the time it's pretty obvious when you're using those tools, and I think that's the case here. And, I, you know, it's not fair for me to criticize an international trailer that put together stuff that we've seen before because that's just the way marketing campaigns mm -hmm. work but you know when you're so close to a movie we've been talking about it for so long it has had a little bit of a controversial history with its marketing campaign anytime i see a headline that says new han solo blah 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 i want it to be the greatest thing i'm still feeling the trailer still feeling the footage i saw before but i was really hoping to get something new in this and there's nothing you know t we've known each other for a while i think i know how you operate pretty well i know nothing gets you out of bed in the morning like hearing that there's a new trailer and a new poster, international version, for Star Wars. Am yeah, I true? I mean, you know me. I, I just love Star Wars. <laughs> I love it. I think about it all the time. Uh, no, you, I mean, Do you still look, have Last Jedi fatigue just from people talking <laughs> about it? You, yes. I mean, it, look, I know it's a, it's a controversial opinion to just, like, not have Star Wars be your thing. It's just not my thing. I mean, I'm happy for the people who love it, but it does not really excite me. This poster does absolutely nothing for me. Has anything I done anything care. for you yet, for the, from, as far as the Han Solo? <laughs> or do you, do you honestly think that, because I'm worried about this, too, from a, from a mass audience standpoint, is that just having a new Star Wars movie with any plot six months after The Last Jedi and all the controversy that followed that might be a little too soon. Uh, possibly, although I do think that the tone of this particular one that I've seen in the trailers looks a little bit more intriguing to me than the typical Star Wars franchise films. I feel like this one seems like it's it's going to be a bit more fun, which, you know, it might have tickled my pickle a little bit, just a little <laughs> tickle, a little tickle. But uh, little tickle of right, the pickle. You're right over there, Jay. Little a, tickle of the... A little a, tickle a of the pickle. A tea of the pea. 
<laughs> and Jay Washington now oh, has boy. to go back to the hospital, <laughs> thanks to T. But uh, generally speaking, it's still it's just it's just not my thing, and uh, I don't apologize for it. But I know there's probably <sighs> fanboys whose heads are exploding right now. But Star Wars just it's not my cup of tea. Uh, we always appreciate honesty and opinions here on the show. <laughs> Jay, uh, two questions: Do you have a pickle, and was it tickled by the international trailer and poster? <clears throat> <laughs> 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 had to clear my throat first on that one. Uh, my pickle was not tickled. Uh, it was fickled, and I felt sick. Are you Dr. Seuss? <laughs> you, 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 you made this happen. My pickle was tickled <laughs> on the pickle. You made this happen. I, I will I kinda, not tickle on a chair. <laughs> <laughs> I will not tickle with the hair. But my pickle wasn't tickled here, and it was not tickled there. Dr. Seuss is rolling over in his grave right now. <laughs> what are they doing? Uh, it's... I agree with Perry with the poster. It looks like somebody just said, hey, y'all take this picture in front of a green screen. We're going to Photoshop some stuff together and put it together. International trailers. The one thing I've loved with like a lot of Marvel trailers with internationally and even some of the DC ones, there's extra footage you haven't seen yet. Stuff that you catch, little Easter eggs here and there. There's nothing new about this one. It's just, again, it's like, here's the trailer for overseas. Here's the poster for overseas. It, and again, going to what you just said, see, it's six months after The Last Jedi. This may not be the greatest idea they've had. I granted it was slated to do what it was going to do already. However, when you saw the reaction to Last Jedi, the mixed reviews, the, the petitions, this, that, and the third, to sit there and say, oh, we're going to bank now on a Han Solo origin story. And yo, people will go get into this because they want to see his origin. They want to see the Millennium Falcon, where it came from. They want to see Donald Glover as a young Lando Calrissian, which I want that fur. Uh, <laughs> if you don't want that fur, something's wrong with your life. I feel like I can get my Andre 3000 on with that fur. But Be careful. I don't want you looking like Frank Lucas at a prize fight. Where just like, why would not? <laughs> why would? But I think it, it's, it's going to be hard to tell because there's so many mixed emotions still in the air. From Last Jedi, and one of the big things about the Last Jedi is that internationally it did not do well. It did so not do well at all. You need to have a great marketing campaign, or at least a different marketing campaign. That's what this is bringing to the table, in my opinion, because you see a lot of classic things that you know. Everybody knows who Chewbacca is. That mm -hmm. looks a lot like Han Solo, and seeing the Millennium Falcon and a huge presence on the poster. If it's not a great move, I think it's at least a smart move, and it's the best hand they have to play. I don't know if there's anything about this that says to me, oh, we know that our movies don't do as well uh, overseas <laughs> as they do domestically. I, I just don't really see what that could possibly be going for. I'm busy trying to predict now, when are we actually going to get new footage for this? And I get the bad feeling that considering that the marketing campaign started so late, that maybe the next and the last official Han Solo right trailer- Right before it drops, it, right before it comes out. Avengers mm -hmm. Infinity War. It might be tacked onto that, and then that's it. Because there's no doubt that Disney's going to be pushing that probably at the end of this month, if not the middle of this month, where we get a new trailer for that. And then that would make the most sense. But overall, even though I did like the trailer, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like they're actually putting enough behind it right now. Yeah, I mean, now. luckily, Disney's operating in a world now where they're releasing a Star Wars movie, like I said, six months after The Last Jedi, but you don't have to wait for Avengers Infinity War to drop May 4th if you don't want to, to release your new trailer and presumably your last trailer. You could drop that in the middle of April anywhere. It could be attached to Infinity War. You could drop that online, try to get some people buzzing about a couple new scenes. You're going to have a few cut-up TV spots that lead us into May, and then Look, we'll see how the movie plays out. I never wanted a Han Solo movie. It was never on my wish list to Santa Claus, but we're getting one from what I've seen of it so far. I'm, I'm intrigued. I like the storyline they're going with. I like the space pirate element of it. So have some classic nostalgia flares we talked about on the show yesterday, but don't overdo it. Don't give us another scene with Darth Vader. Just give us a couple little snippets of things that we love. Maybe have a quick run in with Boba Fett, and I'm going to be happy. Of course, having said that, I am a Star Wars fan, and... Um, you can pretty much do anything to make me happy. You have Han Solo and Chewie <laughs> go to Sonic for two hours, and I'm going to enjoy that movie. Will they both be on the roll? Will they be on the roller skates, though? Because Chewie looks like he'll grab a pair of roller skates. I think. <laughs> 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 Lando pops up in the backseat. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on and remind you guys that we're going to take some of your live Twitter questions at the end of the show. So go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video and use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. I will hopefully be tickling some pickles this weekend in Portland at the Helium Comedy Club. I'll be there Thursday through Saturday. You guys get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com or just follow me on Twitter at MarkEllisLive. Looking forward to meeting you tonight, Clay Williams. We also have a whole lot of stuff going on here at Collider. Later on today, it is Thursday, we're going to have an all-new episode of Jedi. 
I count, so I'm sure they're going to break down all this new Han Solo footage as well as a lot of the news coming out of Lucasfilm and Disney this week. We also have our Oscar show is going to be live. We're going to be doing an Oscar show. The Oscars this weekend, guys. I got to remind me at the end of the show, we got to get our predictions. We're going to be watching the Oscars live along with you all. So we're going to do a live stream uh, here at the studio. The stream is going to be going on all evening long. So we're going to start at 4 p.m. PST. So we're going to give you guys like a half hour pre-show Oscar special where we'll have some of our Collider pundits. Anybody's welcome to come join. If you all want to come hang out, please do so. I'm going to bring a case of Coors Light. Do and I dress up? Do I dress make up? some predictions. Do I Fancy dress up? night, yeah. So I got to wear, okay. Yeah, right. look nice. I have a Bjork swan dress on standby <laughs> that I'm going to wear. <laughs> That would pair really well with Jace Fur. Yeah. This is going to be a great hey. night. Let's do this. Thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can you wear that Lando Fur by, uh, by this weekend? Hey, man, look, I, do, I got a brother in Compton to hook me up real quick. Don't get this fur. I think somebody out there should, I think late to the party should do a, a pre show of our red carpet coming here <laughs> to Kawhi because apparently now I have to get jazzed up too. I get dressed up like four days a week now. Now, now it's going to be five. This I was week. planning on wearing my dinosaur onesie, but now clearly I'm going to be underdressed. So that's like <laughs> There's Perry with Dewey. Dewey's got a little tux on. I'd love to see that. We'd love to see you guys watching the show. And during the show, we're going to keep the stream going. So during commercials, we're going to run in here. We'll have a couple of our pundits to give you our take on what award just went down, what award's coming up. Jimmy Kimmel's monologue. Really excited about all things Oscar. Then we're going to do a post-show recap as well. We also have the live movie trivia showdown is coming up March 15th. You guys can get tickets right now. Just follow me or Christian on social media. Fullscreenlive.com is the place to go. Tickets are still available, but they are selling like hotcakes, so make sure you guys grab them now. The Wildberries versus the Real Rejects are the undercard, and then JTE versus Roca is the main event. It is here in Southern California. If you're going to be in the area March 15th, please come on out, support us, and uh, say hi to me and Christian. We'll be on stage hosting the entire event. One more thing to get to is that yesterday, The Hollywood Reporter dropped a story about us, about Collider, and all the new goings on here at our Collider studios. We're very excited to share in this news with you guys and in that spirit of full transparency to the fans we haven't been able to give you guys updates as much as we've wanted to for the last couple weeks now we get a chance to do so and that's going to take place this monday on monday right after movie talk at 10 a.m PST. We're going to be doing a Collider Town Hall with all the bigwigs. Up on this desk is going to be Frosty, the founder of Collider.com, Mark Fernandez, Christian Harloff, and Dennis Zen. And then over somewhere on a podium is going to be me. I'm going to be like Jim Lair moderating this thing. I get to ask all of the hot take questions or some questions that I want to know. They don't know what I'm going to be asking. I'm going to ask them some questions and then you guys get to participate however you want, whether it's Twitter or in the YouTube chat room. We're going to be taking all your live questions and peppering the brass with with them. Anything you want to know about the past, the present, the future of Collider, we have free reign to ask it during the town hall that's going to be live on Monday and it'll be up on YouTube after the fact. That was a whole lot of talking for me. So now we're going to move on to some live Twitter questions. Before we get to that, I do want to get to know our panel a little bit more as far as what they have coming up. So Jay Washington, it's been a minute, man. Are you back on stage? You uh, you got some yucks to tell? Some yuck yucks, joke jokes, and all those other chuckle chuckles. Uh... <laughs> You know, y'all got me in this rhyming Dr. Seuss scheme. I just want y'all to know. Uh, but this Friday night, uh, 8.30 p.m., you can catch me at the Ha Ha Cafe in North Hollywood. Ha Ha Comedy Club, excuse me. Uh, 4712 Lankerson Boulevard. I'll be on the show. I have no idea what time I'll be on stage. So get there at 8.30. I'll be there telling jokes. All right. Speaking of telling jokes, T, you uh, might be getting back in the game as well. What you got cooking? It is true. I'll be telling some rib ticklers of my own, friends. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be on the last Friday of the month, which is Good Friday, at a pop-up show, which we're calling Best Friday. If you would like details, follow me on Instagram because we will be, or I, <laughs> will be posting more details there <laughs> as, as it gets a little bit closer. And Perry Nemiroff, where are you going to be doing stand-up comedy soon? Uh, yeah, I tickle no pickles, <laughs> but on my Instagram, you might find a cat in a hat. <laughs> <laughs> the hat is officially gone from Jay Washington's head. So we do have one live Twitter question to get to before we say goodnight here. Uh, Janine Devine is a great fan. Our current Twitter name is, is Dormala Janine, and she asked the following. So we might have to have the spoiler alert come up here for this. What is the worst incident of a movie being spoiled for you, whether it's some social media, some jerk with a big mouth, or the actual film promotion giving too much away? The worst case in recent memory of all time of a movie being spoiled for you I know for me, it was The Sixth Sense. And it was, it was a good friend that I, I continue to call a, a dear mate to this day. Uh, my buddy in college, I hadn't seen The Sixth Sense yet. And uh, 
it had been out for a couple months and he just he he just whispered something because they were talking about it. I'm like, oh, I, I hear there's a big reveal. He's like, ah, it, nah, it's, it's nothing big. And then they keep talking. Then he just looks at me and he says, dude was dead. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't know what it meant. And then I'm watching the movie and halfway through I piece it together. I'm like, ah, oh, damn it, Jeff. So he ruined the sixth sense for me, but it still held up as a pretty great movie. T, you have any uh, instances of a movie being spoiled for you? Very similar situation about the dude being dead. And in my <laughs> case, it was ruined, not personally, but for everyone who was watching the, his show, Bill Maher uh, re-Gravity. Uh, for some reason, Gravity came up on real time, and he casually threw out, while it was still in theaters, mind you, it had been out maybe a month, but he's just like, he said something to the effect of George Clooney being a ghost. And I was just like, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't seen it yet. So that definitely, you know, effectively ruined the movie for me. It's, I mean, I, I try to, to, to tread lightly on here a movie talk. And I know a lot yeah. of people watching it are hardcore movie fans. And so if you're just doing like a, a show that's more political or that isn't as movie centric, you'd be very careful about the spoilers you give away. Perry, you ever had a movie ruined for you? Not terribly. I think more so than spoilers being revealed, it's you know, what we all deal with when someone hypes something up and then you get a little let down. And I think one of the worst experiences I've had with that kind of ruining of a movie is probably the movie Goodnight Mommy. Have any of you ever seen that? It's really, it came out like two years ago, super, super intense and violent and disturbing. And Is it a I foreign just, film? Yeah, yeah, I had yeah, a whole bunch of people talk it up because I love the genre and they're like, this is going to be the next classic, the greatest thing ever. And I walked in and I figured out what the twist of the movie was within maybe five minutes of it starting and I was so, so bummed after. Wow. Yeah, that's happened to me too where you figure out the twist immediately just like, oh, two more hours of this. <laughs> I, <laughs> I literally have never suspected a twist in my life. I'm the worst when it comes to guessing what happens in movies. Oh. Jay Washington? Uh, Split was bad for me. I almost judo chopped a friend in the throat when he was like, it's a sequel to Unbreakable. I just was like, <laughs> my hand just literally went up because I was like, How soon after the movie come out? It was two weeks and I hadn't oh, had a chance to see it yet. Yeah. yeah. And almost judo chopped him in the throat. Uh, another movie that I was like, I'm interested in, but people had said, go see it, but then somebody spoiled it, it was Raw. Oh, no. Yeah. That's I was a so bummer. mad when people spoiled Raw for me. I still watched it on Netflix and cried <laughs> and held myself because I was so <laughs> terrified. I was like, I'm never going to veterinarian school. Uh, <laughs> never going. But yeah, it was Raw and Split. It's funny because, like, it, and now, like, like, generationally, you have to be a little careful as to what you give away. I was doing a review on Schmoes a couple of years ago, and we were talking about Top Gun. And I just casually mentioned what the sad thing that happens in the middle of Top Gun. <laughs> and, and, uh, and some kid was like, I can't believe you ruined Top Gun for me. I'm like, it's been out since 1986. <laughs> yeah. But if you were born in 1993, maybe you haven't seen Top Gun yet, but you better get on it because it's a damn good movie. I have a bit I do where I talk about how I can't stand bees and I felt like I was going to end up like Macaulay Culkin in My Girl. Oh, man. And half the crowd goes, hey, man. I was <laughs> like, don't you do this about a movie that's over 20-something years right. old. Were y'all really going to go home and watch My like Girl? There's a statute of limitations. If the movie is that old, that's on you if you still haven't seen it. That's it's on you, the show fault, not mine. Yeah, you just had like a backup of Macaulay Culkin films you haven't quite gotten to in your home video <laughs> the library. It's one of the scene that's in pop culture right now. I feel right. like once that happens, where it's classic in that sense, Yeah, you by can't the way, really if you haven't seen it. Citizen Kane, it was his freaking sled. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, I want to say thank you to all the Rosebuds who joined me here today, as well as all of you guys out there and our very hardworking crew. Props to them for getting all these new graphics in place for us to have a new branded movie talk. My name is Mark Ellis. I'll see you guys in Portland this weekend for the entire crew. I believe Christian Harloff or Mark Riley is going to be hosting the show tomorrow on behalf of my entire panel. I want to say thank you and have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy movie talk tomorrow. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You wanna watch more? Then click up here, or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.